Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in and joining us. We are so glad that you were here and let's go ahead and jump into worship together. Let's stand to our feet. We're gonna learn a new song today. Do you see what I see? You can clap your hands. Do you see what I see? the resurrection I see signs I see signs and I see wonders I see burst of living color Then things coming back to life again I believe there's about to be another resurrection
special, special day in the house of God, and I'm so glad you are here to be a part of it. You walked in at the beginning of the second of two worship celebrations today. We came to glorify and worship our great, awesome King. He is the Lord of all creation. His name is Jesus. Somebody give him praise this morning in the church. Clap your hands. Let's continue to worship together. starting it out in the house of the Lord with us. I think it's a great time just to remind everybody, no matter how this year is starting out, that the hope that we have isn't on how well this new year is gonna go. Can I get an amen from someone this morning? Come on. It's built on what the old song says, nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's where our hope lies. And because of Jesus, 
because he defeated sin, hell, death, the grave, all of that when he died on the cross and was resurrected. We have hope, and it is the foundation of our life today. It's not built on the projection for 2023 or how bad 2022 or good it was to us. It's built on the fact that every day we wake up, we have hope. And we know because we have that hope in our heart, God has put us where he's got us right now to help someone else understand that he is our firm foundation. Come on, let's sing about that to Jesus together.
Come on, let's celebrate the faithfulness of Jesus together. God is so good. Hey, we're not, we're not done worshiping right now. I got a testimony I want to share. Uh, we have been starting off our 21 days of prayer and fasting, and we are we are just now starting week two today. Conveniently, we started that just after last week's chili cook-off, right? Because that's, that's, when, that's when you start a fast, right? We got a prayer request that came in a few days ago. Um, so one of our volunteer leaders in our church, Gloria Avalos, she's a business owner and one of her clients, she heard from her family that she was in the hospital with these terrible blood clots that just came on her all of a sudden. She's fighting for her life. She was unresponsive in the ICU. It was not looking good. About my age, this woman, um, she is a wife and a mother of two. All I can tell you is this. The prognosis was not good, and the outcome was not looking good, but God's people began to pray. And I want to tell you, there is power when God's people begin to call on his name. When we call on the name of Jesus, and we, we look at the bleak situation where the doctors and the physicians, they say it's not going to have a good outcome, but we can call on the great physician. And I know that he knows better, and he knows last what's going to happen. And so we began to pray for her. Her name was Robin. And then all of a sudden, a day or day and a half ago, uh, Gloria gets this garbled up, jumbled up text message from Robin trying to say, hey, I'm so sorry I missed my appointment with you this week. She said it was the greatest text message she's ever received at work, ever in her life. And then she got another one. Oh, it gets better, church. It gets better. She got another one after she had texted and said, my church has been praying for you every single day since we heard this happen. We're fasting and praying this week. She said, you tell them that those prayers saved my life. I was on the ECMO machine fighting for my very last breaths, and God brought me back. Can somebody give God some praise for his healing power? Gosh, come on, we can do better now. Let's give him glory. He's so good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You are the miracle working God that answers prayer. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Somebody say praise the Lord. Have a seat. God bless you. We're going to share a little bit more with you in just a moment here. Hey everybody, welcome to Peak City Church. If you wanna take a second now, there's gonna be a QR code that's flashing on your screen. We would just love for you to fill that out so we can get some information and follow up with you for any questions that you might have for us. One way that we like to be generous here at Peak City Church is by doing Facebook check-ins. If you wanna get on Facebook and check in, this allows us to donate $2 for a life-giving organization here in the Triangle. If you would like to be connected and know everything that's coming up at Peak City Church, you can sign up for the weekly, which is our newsletter, which allows you to get all the information and everything that you need to know about Peak City. Now let's get ready to hear God's word. A time comes when silence is betrayal. We are deeply in need of a new way beyond the darkness that seems so close around us. And if we will only make the right choice, we will be able to transform this pending cosmic elegy into a creative psalm of peace. We will be able to transform the jangling discords of our world into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. We will be able to speed up the day all over America and all over the world when justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Hey, I, again, I'm so excited about today in particular and that we have uh, the opportunity to hear about the Ministry of Compassion International and what they're doing. I'm, I'm a firm believer in their ministry and how they're impacting the world and raising children and families out of poverty in Jesus' name. Uh, and so, you know, before we get into the word, I just want to ask you a question. Have you ever... Have you ever had a time where you were in need, like you, you just, you kind of hit a hard spot and you needed some help and then kind of out of nowhere, somebody helped you out? Ever, anybody ever been there? I mean, I have, like there's several people in the room. Look, for me personally, uh, I, I think there's an old adage. <laughs> it's true for me, it might not be true for you, but I think the, the phrase is everybody hates a redneck until your car breaks down, right? Like, and then all of a sudden you need one and they're the only one that'll stop and help you, you know? Uh, well. This wasn't that situation, but years ago, 
I was looking on Craigslist when I was in my early 20s, and I found that somebody was giving away an old motorcycle for the price of free. Can I, can I let you know that that's in my budget, all right? Like, that was, that was perfect for me at the time. And so I told Angela, I was like, hey, um, if, I, if I'm gone for a long time, I'm going to a place to get a free motorcycle, and if I don't come back, that's probably why. So she was like, okay, cool, gotcha. So I went up to this place in North Raleigh. Sure enough, it was sitting right there. It was this old 1982 Yamaha Exciter II. It was 250 cc's and nothing, right? I mean, but it was cool. It was a motorcycle. It looked, it almost looked like a little mini chopper. I was huge on it. It was like some giant animal riding on a tricycle, basically. But I didn't care. It was a motorcycle. Uh, I brought it home. got it in my truck, you know, and got it home. And they, the, the people that gave it to me said, look, this is not going to run. Here's all the paperwork we have on it. It hadn't been started in X number of years. I said, okay, cool. Got it home, cleaned the contact points, changed the battery, changed out the oil, fired right up. Kaboom. It started running. I was like, well, praise God. All right. So I was excited. This thing got 82 miles to the gallon. Mm, that's right. Some of y'all are like, maybe we should look into this motorcycle thing here. Yeah. So uh, it had a speedometer on it and that's about it. You know, I was riding along one day around Jordan Lake and I was way on out on the Chatham County side on some back road somewhere. And all of a sudden, man, boom, it just, it conked out. I ran out of gas. I thought I had more left than I had. I did not, clearly. And I was about three, three and a half miles away from the nearest gas station. So I was about to get off my bike and just start walking. And when this guy in this beat up old pickup truck pulled up beside me and he said in, in his, his heavy, he just he had a heavy Spanish accent. He said, hey man, can I help you? Um, I said, sure, you know. Uh, so he said, hop in the truck, we'll get, you, we'll get you some gas. And I said, look man, I said, uh, I don't have my wallet on me. I was just cruising around, no wallet, nothing. And he's getting the truck. I'm going to help you. And so this guy, he said uh, he was from southern Mexico. And he's telling me his story. And as, uh, as I was riding along with him, he actually found, got us to a gas station. He had a two-liter bottle that was empty in his truck. And he filled that whole thing up with fuel for me. And we came back and put that in the tank of my little motorcycle. And basically, that, that two-liter bottle almost filled the whole tank up, you know. And I said, man, let's go back to my house. I'm not far away. I'd love to pay you for this. And he said, no. He said, I would never take any money you'd offer me. Not for a second. Because one day, I might be over there in the ditch. And I'll need somebody to come along and help me. And I never saw the man again. I'll never forget that moment. And that wasn't like a, I was gonna die kind of moment. It was just something that was profound in my mind and in my heart where I always remembered that somebody that did not have to went out of their way to help me and didn't just help me, they blessed me, right? They gave me something that I didn't ask for. I was just gonna hang out at the gas station and call my wife up and be like, hey girl, you get off work in like five hours. This is where I'm gonna be, Come, you know? But, but it was so much more than that. But today, we have an opportunity not just to help somebody in a way that's gonna be profound in their heart and they'll remember once. But we have an opportunity to touch a life in a way that will transform the rest of their life. Not just in a moment for a time or a season, but literally you will change the trajectory of somebody's life today in Jesus' name through the ministry of Compassion International. They are lifting and raising the poorest of the poor out of poverty all over the world in Jesus' name. So, so who are the poor? Who are they? Jesus called them in Matthew 25, the least of these. See, these are the people that go through life without enough. I love the way Scott says this. He, he says that the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is enough. Can you imagine being a child going four days without having any food to eat? Because there's two thirds of the world where children are seeing that stark poverty and living in it every single day. You see, Jesus calls the poor that those, are, those, that, that those that don't have enough food or water or medicine or shelter or education or community and family. He calls the poor the vulnerable. They're children and they're widows and homeless and refugees and they're children that are forced into prostitution or slave labor or they're abused or they're exploited. And they are people that have no power to provide or protect for themselves. And church, isn't that what love is? 
isn't that what love is, that it would protect and provide? Isn't that what the love of Jesus inside of us urges us to do when we see a need around us to protect and to provide? Listen, that is what Compassion International is empowering people like you and me to be able to do in Jesus' name for somebody that is in desperate, desperate need. Now look, the poor are everywhere, and when we look at the need of the world, one of the biggest challenges that we find in actually helping the poor, it's not that we don't have enough. It's not that at all. In fact, every single person in this room by the standards of the rest of the world is rich. Can I say it again? Y'all rich. I mean, like you are, we are wealthy. And you don't think that you are. Let me paint this picture for you, okay? Because you might be like, Nate, you don't, mm -mm, I'm not wealthy. All right, so let's look at the standards here. I have been with Scott in the nation of Kenya, in the city of Nairobi, in one of the slums that was about eight miles wide. And I think in that eight mile slum, there was about a million people, am I right, that was living there. And most of all of them live in a 10 by 10 room. Families of seven, eight, nine, 10 people living together in a 10 by 10 room. In fact, I heard a testimony of one of those families where they were praising God that there was one corner in their 10 by 10 room in the slum where they could all stand when it was raining and they could stay dry. And they talked about how they had to do this sometimes all night long. You see, poverty is very, very different when we think about it outside of an American context. But for us to say, for me to say to you, we're wealthy. Well, let's, let's phrase it this way. This morning you woke up in your climate controlled home, didn't you? Where if you're cold, you can turn the heat up. And if you're hot, you can turn the air conditioner down. In fact, you woke up probably in a nice warm bed that was free from insects coming in and out or intruders walking in and out of that home to either rob you or kidnap you. And then after that, you went into your bathroom and you actually have a toothbrush and toothpaste that you bought with money that you have because you have a job where you can earn money and you were able to brush your teeth and go through simple hygiene processes. Maybe you had running water in your bathroom where you took a bath and you went to one of your, I don't know, five to eight different sinks possibly inside of your home to be able to wash up that morning with your clean, disease-free water that you could drink freely if you wanted to. And then you came downstairs, if you've got stairs in your house, you went down the hallway because there's more than one room in your house, probably many rooms in your house, into your kitchen where you opened up this refrigerated box that kept food cool and fresh for weeks at a time. You reached inside of that box that was full of food that was there for you to eat whenever you wanted to and got yourself some breakfast. And then after that, you went up and you went through the many, many different shirts and pants and shoes and clothes that you have for yourself and everyone in your family got them dressed. And then you got in your automobile that you own that can drive you anywhere that you want to go that you can afford because of your job that's full of gas. And the fuel that went in the tank of that vehicle was more than one third of the income that a person on the other side of the world has in an entire month to get here today to this beautiful $75 million school facility where we rent on the weekends to be able to have church. Who was wealthy? You see, having something is not sin. There's nothing wrong with that. Having more is not sin. There's nothing wrong with that. But I believe that as followers of Jesus Christ, when God has blessed us with more than enough, we simply need to remember what the more is for. We need to remember that we can enjoy that more, but we need to use that to be a blessing to others. Otherwise, if we don't, we get caught up in the disease of self. Self will ruin you. It is a trap and it is a trick. Satan uses this disease of self to make you think that the world revolves around you, that the greatest problems in the world are the ones that you have, that life is hard because you just feel like it is because you don't have anything else to compare it to. And you get shrunk down into the world of you where everything about yourself is seeking after what can make you happy, what you want, what affects you, what you think and how you think things ought to be. And what it does is cause us to take our eyes off of the real need in this world. And the challenge for us in America is that we're in such a consumer culture that it can grab us without us ever knowing. You might say, well, Pastor Nate, nah, we're... We're not really like that as the church. Well, listen, I certainly hope we're not, but to a certain degree, we are. Remember three years ago when the pandemic first hit and you went in the grocery store, what was it that you could not find? Say it louder. 
That's right, Church Online, if you didn't say it out loud, they're saying toilet paper. And you know that you saw there was like two packs of it left, and you saw that old senior citizen round in the corner, but you were like, man, I got kids and I got butts to wipe. Here we go. And you ran in and you grabbed it anyway, and you like started walking out. Just, you know, you've all been there. That happened for weeks and weeks and weeks on end, and it reminded us that we're in a consumer culture. And Americans today, we're too stressed and anxious and feeling unhappy in our hearts. And I, I think this, this actually seeps into the Christian church as well because we're chasing all the stuff that culture says we're trying to go after. Like we need to keep up with the Joneses. We need to be able to work hard so we can live the good life. When God has already promised us that if we surrender our hearts to him completely, that we will live a life that is more abundant than anything that this world could ever give us. In fact, he will cure us from the disease of self. He will free us from this disease of want and selfishness. He'll allow us to live a selfless life. This is what Jesus taught because he taught the opposite of this consumeristic ideal. He said this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Listen to verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. He says this three times in the New Testament. He's coming back and he's got rewards based on what we're gonna give and what we've done. And when he returns one day, oh, I hope there's so many jewels and a crown that I can lay at his feet and worship for all that he's blessed me with and how I was able to bless others. Now look, poverty, here's what it is. It's simply not having enough. It's going without basic needs. And it's not just a physical thing. Like, you know, it's not just about physical needs and getting food in your belly, but it's emotional, educational, and it is spiritual. And compassion attacks poverty in all of those fronts. They go after the spiritual poverty and they introduce them to hope in the name of Jesus, showing children there is a God in heaven that loves them and that he is their provider, he is their father, and he is their friend. They actually get these kids educations. You have to pay for public education around the world in the poorest parts of the world. Did you know that? It's, it's not free. And so they will get the child in school to be educated if they're sponsored through Compassion International. And then they will tend to their emotional needs. They have counselors that work with these kids every day, building them up, letting them know they're gonna make it, that God has a plan for their life and they're for their physical needs as well. They get healthy meals. They immediately get medical care and treatment for them, job training for their families and parents. It's incredible to see what God does through this ministry. The bottom line is there are all these different reasons why we would say we can't make a difference, but I'm here to tell you, yes, you can. There is room at your table to make a difference in somebody's life today. And if you would capture this vision of just knowing what's happening today isn't an opportunity to make somebody's life a little bit nicer. No, no, no. What's happening today is your opportunity to take some child that would be dead by the age of 15 or 16 years old and give them a life that is transformed where they're gonna know Jesus, they're gonna go back into their communities and they're gonna build those communities and raise others out of poverty in Jesus name. The opportunity is right in front of us today. Why then? Why compassion? Listen, they're in 25 countries trying and making the, the best attempt I've ever seen at raising the 385 million children in the world today in poverty out of it in the name of Jesus. In fact, my friend Scott Limerick is going to come up in just a little bit and share with us. But before we get to that, I just wanted to let you know, I, I've actually been to Kenya. I've been on site with Scott and seen a Compassion Project. I want to show you some of these pictures. This is actually the church for the Compassion Project where we were in the Maasai area of Kenya. And these are some of the pastors here and some of the beautiful people that are a part of that project. Let me show you this next picture as well. This is job training. Compassion actually teaches mothers and fathers ways to be able to make an income, to be able to buy food. So it's not just the child that's sponsored by Compassion 
generation that's raised out of poverty. Because of this, the entire family is raised out of poverty. This woman is making soap that she then sells in the marketplace so that she can afford to pay for her rent and for her food for her other children in her family. Let's show you this one. This is an entire family. They were showing me how they make their homes. That's what you see in the background. They make them out of dung and mud. And they were talking about how overjoyed they were to have places to live. This is one beautiful family right here. And there's some of the children that are in the compassion program as well, being given the gospel. And it wasn't just the kids that are affected by that, but the mothers of these children and the fathers are coming to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. I could talk all day about compassion, but I want to invite a very special guest to come and share. In fact, all the way from the Philippines by way of Texas, we have a testimony of a child that grew up in the Compassion Program who's now a grown woman, and she's got something to say about our great God and Savior Jesus. Would you welcome Kiwani Kiwi Cook to the stage as she comes to share her testimony? Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Uh, second service is my favorite service because <laughs> I've already slipped in, slept in and I'm ready. I'm re It's just, just a, such an honor to be here to worship the Lord with you. If you would have told me 15 years ago, hey, Kiwi, you're going to be at Peak City Church in Apex, North Carolina to declare of what God has done for you, to testify of what God has done in your life, I would tell you it is impossible because of what I have been through. But with God, nothing, absolutely nothing is impossible with him. We were talking about the pandemic. And I remember I was traveling for compassion at that time, two, two years ago. And everything stopped. And I was stuck in, in, our, in my house, in our house. And then the Lord was like telling me, Kiwi, do not be afraid. Do not be scared. Listen to the birds out there. They don't toil. They don't work. But I feed them. I will do it again. If I can do it for you before, I will do it again and again and again. We'll take you out of poverty. You know, I was born and raised in the Philippines to a very poor family. My dad, he's an alcoholic, and each night, my parents, they would fight because he's always drunk. There are three brothers ahead of me who died because of lack of medical attention. My third brother, he was supposed to be born cesarean section, but my parents could not afford uh, the medical care necessary. So what they did, they cut my mom open without proper anesthesia. My mom screamed for pain, but my brother didn't survive. But after that, I was born in another sister. And I remember growing up in the Philippines, it was so difficult that there are several nights, me and my sister, we would beg our parents, Ma, Pa, we could not sleep because we were so hungry. But even my parents would give up the food that they're about to eat each night, which is most of the time rice and soy sauce or rice and salt, it would still be not sufficient. I remember I would look at my neighbor's window and pretend to watch their television from outside of their house. But I would look at their table and see food and wonder, why do they have food tonight and us not? And I remember vividly when apples were imported from America to the Philippines. And I would beg my mama, Ma, please, I want to taste this apple. But even a rotten apple, my parents could not afford to buy. But you know what? This is not a sad story because we have a good father in heaven. One day, my dad was always drunk, pick up a track. I know there's a lot of young people here. A track is a reading material about Jesus. <laughs> and in the track, it says to go to a crusade. And in the crusade, my dad heard about the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have an everlasting life. And in that crusade, my dad received Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. And for the very first time, my dad went home sober. <laughs> When everybody else said, hey, your dad's not going not gonna to change. He's, he's going to die an alcoholic. But the word of God says, nothing is impossible with me. When he went home, my mother was so shocked. What's wrong with you? What happened? Why are you sober? And my dad said, nothing is wrong with me. I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior, and you need to come to church with me. 
So he brought us to church. Me and my sister, we would sit in Sunday school. And in Sunday school, they would sing about Jesus, that God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that Jesus loves the little children, all the children in the world, red, yellow, black, and white, that they are precious in his sight. But as a young kid, I could not comprehend that. Who is this Jesus? If he cares and if he provides, then why do we live this way? But the, the, my story didn't stop there because we have a good, good father in heaven. At the age of seven, I was registered to the compassion program in a church. And at the age of seven, somebody from Australia picked up a packet and he started to sponsor me. And the very first thing in his letter, he said, Kiwi, you are pretty and Kiwi, Jesus loves you. You know, I've never thought of myself as pretty or beautiful when I was a kid. It's not in our culture to tell our kids, oh, you're so beautiful, you're so pretty, you can be what you want to be. But later on in my life, I begin to realize, Lord, is this how you see me? That I'm beautiful and wonderful in your sight. That I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. That I am a child of the one true God. So I would go to the Compassion Project. And my teacher there, she told me, hey, Kiwi, yes, this is your situation. You are poor, but this is not your destiny. For in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, saith the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And sometimes we stop in that verse. But the following verses, it says, Seek me and you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. So I begin to open my Bible. I begin to read the words of God. I begin to grasp the promises of God in my life. I begin to believe that those words are true. When I was nine years old, my family decided to move to the central business district of the Philippines, Manila. And I was thinking, if we move, how about my, my compassion sponsor? But you know what? Our God is not bound by distance or time. Because when we moved this to the Central Business District, there's a church there with a compassion program. And my sponsor just continued to sponsor me. And I told my mama when I was in high school, Ma, I don't want to be poor anymore. I want to get out of this situation. I want to be able to go to college and take up something. I want to be somebody. And my mama said, let's pray because God will provide. God will provide. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And you know what, guys? God did provide. Out of 25 partner countries, the Compassion Sponsors, they launched a program to send school to college. And they didn't launch it in, in any other country but my country, the Philippines. And I was one of the first few students who was able to go to college. And I am now a physical therapist working in a hospital in Dallas, Texas. Our God is so good and faithful. You know, after college, I need to take a very difficult exam. And I was so scared to fail. I was so scared of the unknown. I don't know about you, but I was so scared of what will people think if I fail. Because maybe I think, maybe because I believed in myself and not believing in what God can do to me. But every time I opened by the Bible, God would tell me, Kiwi, is there anything too hard for me? And the answer is nothing, absolutely nothing is too hard for the Lord. All of my promises for you are yes and amen. Out of 1,700 students who took the exam, I landed 10th place. <laughs> and because of that, our government gave me a medal. And as I was receiving this medal, I told the Lord, Lord, if only my sponsors were here, I'm going to give this medal to them. Because of them, this is a reality. You know, I know that this is your prayer and fasting week. And in our church too, we have prayer and fasting. And I usually don't join because I was hungry when I was a kid. <laughs> but that year I joined. And what I prayed for is that I'm going to be able to, to see my sponsors. And you know what? Our God is not only a God who hears prayers, but he's able to do it. He is able to give it into fruition. That year, January passed, February passed, and March came. 
a group of Australian sponsors came to the Philippines. And because my sponsor is Australian, they asked me to give my testimony. And after that, they told me, hey, Kiwi, we want you to come to Australia, and we want you to meet your sponsors. And I think I have a picture for you. When I saw them, I ran to them and hugged them and over and over again, I told them, thank you so much. You didn't just change my life, but my family. And I know one day my community, because my mom became a pastor of a small community church in the Philippines. And you know what? Three years ago, we opened our own kids ministry in our own backyard. And we named it to God be the glory kids ministry to give God all the glory and honor and praises for what he has done in my life, in our lives. And 14 years ago, I came to America to work as a physical therapist. And 10 years ago, I got married to a wonderful man from Chattanooga, Tennessee. I don't know why people laugh when I tell them that my husband, yes, he is a southern boy. And um, during the wedding, I invited my parents to come to the United States. And you know where it took them after the wedding? I think I have a picture for you. I took my parents to an apple orchard in LEJ, Georgia. Remember the apple story? And my dad, <laughs> he's picking up apples from the ground. And I said, no, Dad, God has blessed us exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. That we're now able to pick up apples from the tree, the freshest of apples. And at that moment, in that apple orchard in LEJ, Georgia, we're just celebrating about the goodness, the grace, the compassion, the love of God in our lives. And I know that God has blessed us not to just keep it to ourselves. God has blessed us to be a blessing to other people, to be his hands and feet to other people. I am now a sponsor of four children. Two from the Philippines, because I'm biased. <laughs> One from Haiti and a little boy named Juan from Bolivia. And several years ago, I went back home and saw my sponsored children. I think I have a picture for you. And I told them, hang in there. Do not ever, ever, ever give up. If God can do it to me, he can do it to you. Maybe that's a word for you to, today too. Hang in there. Do not ever, ever give up. God loves you so much. He cares for you. If he knows the number of our hair, how much more he knows our desire, our wants, our plans for our lives. But you know what? We can plan for ourselves, but it is God's plan who prevails. He cares for you. He, he loves us so much. One day, God will give you a chance, an avenue, even a platform to tell your neighbors, to tell an acquaintance, to tell a friend to tell a church, to tell the world that we have a good, good Father in heaven. To him be all the glory and honor and praises forever and ever. Thank you so much and God bless you all. How powerful to be able to see a living example of what God is doing through Compassion International. Remember that what we're going to do today, it's not just a good gesture. It is life transforming. For $38 a month, Compassion is doing something that works. You might say, well, Pastor Nate, why, why Compassion? Of all the organizations out there that are doing work like this, I, I like stuff that works. Can I get an amen? Listen, my, the computers we use here are MacBooks because they work. You PC people don't like throw shade at me, okay? Uh, I drive a diesel truck to tow the church's trailer out there because that works. It's what I need. I wear Levi jeans because I'm a big guy, and when I sit down, I don't like it when my clothes split. You might think that's funny, but the big guys are like, think about it. It's true. You know, just I, I like stuff that works, and I know that compassion works. In fact, I think this is the best operating organization like this on the planet, and there's some great ones out there, but listen, 83 cents of every dollar of that $38 a month goes straight to the children that are being rescued from poverty. They run a global, international organization like this on 17% of the overall revenue. 
because they're doing it in Jesus' name. And every child that gets sponsored, they get a school uniform, they start getting an education, they get, they get healthy meals, they get immediate medical care, they get a couple of, actually, outfits, they get an unbroken pair of shoes, and then their parents start getting impacted by the ministry, like I showed you before, with job training, and there's so many other details that I could tell you about. But look, the bottom line is this. Can I, can I share the scripture uh, that I had there, production team? from Luke 14, when we look at the words of Jesus and what he says to us, he gives this parable, he talks about this great banquet. As he's telling the story, this is what he says. He says, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and blind and the lame. And the servant said, sir, what you've commanded has been done and there is still room. I just, I'm looking out in the crowd today and I just wanna tell you this, I believe in this organization. I'll never ask you to do something I'm not willing to do myself. My wife, Angie and I, we sponsor two children. We have an 11 year old, we call him our son. His name is Nat Nail. I, I wanna show you his picture as well. This is Nat Nail and he's, he lives in Ethiopia. We started sponsoring him nine years ago. Isn't that right, babe? Yep, nine years ago. And then for our, five, for our eight year old daughter, Caroline, we decided we'd sponsor another child. We started sponsoring Mercy, and she lives in Kenya. And so she's growing up at the same pace there as our 8-year-old and our 11-year-old. And today, we've decided to sponsor a 5-year-old boy because I have a son that's 5. Today, for the first time, we're going to start sponsoring this little guy. His name is Aiden, and he is from the nation of Nicaragua. Uh, Because you know what? We have room for one more. And I just want you to take a moment to look into your heart today, even if you're already sponsoring a child, and just ask yourself the question, ask the Lord, is there room for one more? I want you to watch this video. Growing up as a child, life was very hard. And many other times that if we didn't have food, then we'd go to scavenge in the, in the dumping sites. I didn't have food the day before neither the other day before. I only knew that I was hungry and I needed food. As a child, I grew up with a lot of hopelessness and I knew that death was the best thing for me. At the age of seven, I lost three family members. I lost my mom and I lost my stepdad. I lost my small brother, Patrick, because of the terrifying disease of HIV AIDS. In the middle of prostitution. Feeling so helpless. Poverty made me feel less valued. It made me feel not loved. It made me feel uh, less of a human. Because it's so hard when you have not eaten dinner and knowing you will not have lunch and you're not assured for dinner the following day, it's just feeling very helpless, like things are not going to be better. I lost four of my siblings due to preventable diseases. Uh, Three of them uh, died before the age of five. My sister, we were sleeping with her in the same bed and she, she had died. Things changed later when I joined the program. When I started attending the Compassion Project, I was learning about the Bible, but the most important thing for me was that I was receiving food. I got an opportunity to go to school. Uh, with a pair of school uniform, with a pair of shoes. My mother heard about a church that worked with children. They're taking care of me, tutors, a pastor, a compassion director. Words are very powerful. My life was changed because someone told me, I believe in you, I love you, and I know you will succeed in life. My sponsor was a college student from Michigan, and in the first letter, She just told me that she wanted to make room for me. My sponsor, he was eight years old when I was nine, so he was one year younger than me. 
one decision to make room for one more changed my life. Saved my life. Saved my life. Will you make room for a child that needs you? Will you make room for one more? It's up to you. My name is Rafael. My name is David. My life was changed by a 26 years old college student. Her name is Joan. Gail and Roger. Her name is Jamie. My sponsor made room for one more. And that one more. And that one more was me. Was me. Sponsor a child through compassion today. Release a child from poverty in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. So now that we know uh, what this guy is all about, it's a simple representation for all of us to be reminded that God has blessed us with so much, but, but there's always room for one more. Let's fill that empty chair today with a child in need. Look, I could talk about compassion all day, but I wanna welcome the expert, the OG, the original gangster of them all, Mr. Scott Limerick. Will you welcome him as he comes out? He's the... He's the Southeast representative for all churches for Compassion International. He's going to tell us more about child sponsorship. Wow. You guys have been great. Thank you, Nate. Um, Nate is doing it all today, isn't he? I mean, like, thank you for that. Can we just thank him for that? Seriously. <laughs> Listen, I know you're ready. You've heard the story. You're like, okay, dude, let me go, right? Um, I think one of the, the really cool things about the stories that we all have, each one of you have a story that God's writing. Did you even know that? Like the things you're doing now, he's just layering you to get ready to do the things that's coming next. Like Kiwi's story is, is just one of thousands of stories like that. We don't just march one success story from compassion out here. Um, and I like to always remind people of that. There's so many Kiwis. Now, and they all have a crazy story about how God took them from where they were to where they are now and that he's not finished yet. One of the things that Kiwi shared in first worship that I had forgotten about is, you know, she talked about how she was so hungry. What did you tell me that your husband does for a living now? He's an executive chef. So she'll never be hungry again, right? And now she's eating like really good food. So I just, that's what God does. That's what God does. And it seems, if you look at history, I'm a history geek. If you look at scripture and history, if, you don't, if you're not a Christian, that's cool. Just look at history, right? It's rare that the people that were born into wealth, it's rare that God ever uses them to do big things. Not because he doesn't want to use them, because they just don't feel like, I don't think I really need God. I've got everything I need, right? It's the people that start from nothing that God seems to, they really appreciate it. That's why Compassion Kids tend to be the kids in their communities that are just the, the, the big time achievers. And it's not because of anything in them that wasn't there to begin with. It just took you and me as sponsors to kind of awaken that, um, that emotional poverty to address that, that hopelessness that's there in poverty. So I'm thankful for that. It's holistic child development that works. And here's why it works. We have learned that with extreme poverty that tends to be generational, you can't take the person out of poverty till you take the poverty out of the person. And that's true here in Wake County, not just in Kenya and Peru, not just in in Nicaragua, not just in the Philippines, right? It's everywhere. Poverty is a monster and it's holistic in nature. And so what, you, what we've got now are tables here and here. We've got tables in the lobby. We've got a packet that looks like this. And on all of these tables are real children, just like Kiwi was. And that's what each packet represents, right? And they're waiting on a sponsor, just like her sponsors, just they're waiting on me and you, a rescuer. That's what they're waiting on. And the, the form is like one piece in three sections. And the top part will give you a picture of your child, the name they go by, and their date of birth. 
We had a lot of people looking for certain dates of birth in, in uh, first worship. We hopefully will have pretty close to the date of birth that you need. If you don't find the exact date, I'll be standing here and you find me and we'll, we'll find that exact date for you. But it tells you that on the back of the, the uh, top section, it will give you a refresher, a reminder of what the $38 a month covers. But as I was telling a lady at the end of first worship, it covers way more than just this just so you'll know that. It really, truly does. And God just does the loaves and fishes thing with it. I don't know how, but he does. But the middle section will tell you more about your child and the community they live in. All we need you to do is tear off the bottom piece, just fill out the front and the back of that and bring it to the tables. How easy is that? right? Many of you in the room will do like uh, some people did in first worship. You'll rescue more than one child, which is awesome. Um, you can. I know you can. Um, I'm rescuing way more than one child, and God just does something supernatural with the finances. I've, I've had pastors say, for the, for the price of one latte, you can change a person's life forever, and you can. I'm telling you, you can keep the latte. You can. God will just provide. We've given up nothing. My wife's here, she can tell you that. Have we given up anything to sponsor our kids? No. Made a commitment to God that every year I'm at Compassion, and this is not about us, this is just about God. It's always about God. Always remember that. It's not about you, or what you think you can do. But I made a commitment to God that for every year he leaves me at Compassion, we're gonna add another child. And I start my 10th year at Compassion this coming July. So we were going to wait till July and we were going to sponsor our 10th kid. But while we were at an event in Nashville over Christmas, there was a little girl whose date of birth was the day after mine. She was from the country. I wanted to sponsor a kid from every country eventually. And I wanted to sponsor a kid from El Salvador. She's from El Salvador. And her name's Carolina. And I'm a big Carolina fan. I couldn't turn it down. So we're rescuing 10 kids and we've given up nothing to do it. Right, and we don't, we don't make the money Nick does. Who does, right? No, I'm, I'm, I'm totally kidding. But we, it's not about that. It's about what God's getting ready to do in your life and use you to help others. Just like uh, Pastor Nate said, it's, you know, wealth is not the opposite of poverty. It's enough, all right? So if you do more than one child a day, that's cool. Just tear off the bottom pieces, just fill out one card, staple them together, and you will only ask you to fill out one card and bring those to the table. So yes, you can take the top two sections with you, but please don't take them until we get the bottom part. Does that make sense? It's totally tax deductible, 100% tax deductible. You can let your business pay for it. If you're watching online, you're part of our church family too. And if you wanna join this movement of God, you can do that by simply texting the word PEAK, P-E-A-K. Text the word PEAK to 83393 and you will get a link to one of the children that is from one of the partner churches of Peak City Church in one of our four focus countries, okay? Look, I'm, I'll be down here. I know you're ready. I'm, are you ready? I'm ready. I'm gonna ask you to stand. Can you do that for me? Yeah, kinda. <laughs> Did you hear all the joints popping? Where do you get my age, people? Yeah. Um, today, I'm an athlete and I got coached hard. When you're my age, the coaches were mean, right? They're, and our coach used to just say it, and I'm just gonna say it today. You're not gonna be able to stand in front of God now. And when God says, I gave you an opportunity, why didn't you do it? You cannot say this word, this phrase anymore. I didn't know. So now that you know, you got two choices. Make a difference or make an excuse. Nobody's on commission. Nobody gets paid extra if you sponsor kids. It's not that. It's about God and what he wants to do in your life today. All right, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna pray. We're gonna end a little different. It's gonna be kind of awkward even. We're not gonna do church, we're gonna be the church. Isn't that cool? That's when your life will change. If you're kind of bored with your walk with God right now, I especially wanna talk to the men. Guys, I speak to a lot of men. Dude, I, that Christian thing's just boring to me. Listen, if you're bored with your walk with God, it's not God. You just gotta let him get you out of your comfort zones, out of your conveniences. 
let him kind of make you get out of this routine, this, this kind of lazy routine we've gotten in. So get off the Christian treadmill today and make a difference in somebody's life. And I'm gonna pray, and when I say amen, I'm just gonna ask you to meet us at the tables. Now that you know the need, let me go, Scott. All right, let me pray for us. Let's do that. God, we love you, we do. It's my heart that as we say words like, I love you, God, that the outside world could look at our lives and see proof that we love you. Because we can't ignore those in need around us and say that we love you. That's what your, your word tells us. That's what scripture says, that how can you hate your neighbor and say you love me? And I, we just can't do it. And so I pray that you will give us the courage today to step out in faith. I pray that you'll do that. Lord, help us to live a little more simply so some kids and families can simply live. And you will bless us in the, in the process. We'll rescue them through your power and your love, and you'll turn right around and rescue us. And I love that, and I love you, and I love this church too, God. Move us. In your name I pray, amen. All right, guys, let me see you at the tables. Thank you for moving already, amen. Hey, so like Scott said, you can just make your way down. We have tables right down front here. Volunteers that know how to get you signed up. If a bigger crowd forms, you can always check out a sponsorship table as you walk out those doors as well. Thank you for letting God use you to transform lives today. Man, it was so awesome being able to engage and worship and dive into the Word together today. Thank you guys so much again for joining us, and we look forward to celebrating again with you. We'll see you right back here next week.